Welcome back, everybody. Um, this is PyCon. It's still October 2016. <laughs> um, please give a warm welcome to our next two speakers. Um, it is um, Ted Peterzak and um, uh, Sam Kitani. So Sam and I are here today to talk to you about how Jumo is using Python to power our vision um, for financial inclusion across Africa. So if you look at the stats that our friends at the GSM Association put out, um, they will tell you that there are over 2 billion people in the world today who are unbanked without access to any kind of reliable, uh, secure, or affordable financial services. So mobile money is very rapidly becoming the avenue through which the unbanked actually can get access to financial infrastructure. We know that at the end of 2015, there were over 270 mobile money services of some sort available in 93 different countries across the world trying to serve that need. Mobile money in the last decade has brought financial inclusion to more people than the traditional bricks and mortar uh, banking industry has in the last century. So our vision for Jumo is to be a mobile money marketplace through which anybody can receive any financial service product over their phone. <coughs> so if you look at where we're operating today, which is Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see that it's very much defined by the lack of infrastructure, right? Electricity is a reasonable proxy for lack of brick and mortar facilities as well. Um, but there is one thing that is available, it's ubiquitous even, uh, throughout Africa, even where the uh, other kinds of infrastructure are weak. And that is the mobile phone. Market penetration in Africa uh, averages north of 80% as a percentage of population. Um, and Africa itself is actually a global leader in mobile money. Over 80% of all of the world's mobile money transactions occur in the continent of Africa. 15 African countries comprise, uh, excuse me, there are 15 African countries in the top 20 mobile money marketplaces worldwide. Okay, so how does Jumo fit into this? Um, so while we are a mobile money marketplace, our primary business today is as a lender. Um, and so when you think about what the mobile money ecosystem looks like, there's three main components to it. The very obvious component is the consumer out there, the guy walking around with his phone that needs to borrow a little money. Um, we make, a, make unsecured loans today, very small ones, very short duration, um, based on the transactional history um, that we get from our mobile network operator partners. And we also spend a great deal of effort um, making sure that we don't put our consumers on the back foot by lending them more money than they can afford to repay. So we do quite a bit of analysis on their transactional, on their wallet transactional history as well. Um, the, other, the other corner there uh, would be the merchant. Um, so Jumo can provide liquidity to merchants to kind of help them through the ebbs and flows of their cash flow. It's very common in the merchant industry um, in all parts of the world. We can extend that to people who would ordinarily not have access to liquidity <coughs> because they're not in the traditional banking infrastructure. And then finally, perhaps, uh, perhaps the most important are the agents, the people who are the ATMs of the mobile money industry. This is where you get money in and out of the mobile money system where there's no other way to do it. And those folks themselves have substantial liquidity needs because of the amount of money that they're moving in and out of their mobile money wallets. GMO can extend loans to help them as well. So what is GMO today then? Um, as I said, we are a micro lender. We are not a bank. We are funding the loans that we do today um, off of our balance sheet. And we are partnering aggressively with um, other banks and financial institutions to bring other classes of services to the Jumo platform. Everything we do today is with our customers. 
um, be they merchant, agent, or consumer, is over the mobile phone. There's no web interface. We're operating um, uh, with everyone. And then finally, uh, we, do, we do integrate very closely with our mobile network operator partners. We rely on their infrastructure for things, um, particularly for money transactions, their wallet software. So Jumo makes pretty extensive use of Python uh, for some very good reasons. Um, we've been around for about two and a half years. There are um, a lot of, were a lot of questions initially about whether um, uh, Jumo could effectively disrupt the marketplace, they could run a loans business. Uh, it's very important to be able to develop quickly, to um, deploy quickly, to fail fast sometimes, and recover from that inexpensively. Um, through Elastic Beanstalk, uh, Python is very cloud friendly. Um, it gives us a great way to manage our manage and scale our environment uh, as our transaction volume is growing almost exponentially. And then finally, Python is very much batteries included. So there are a lot of well-documented, well-supported libraries out there, which means that there's functionality that we don't have to go reinvent. <coughs> so one of the um, defining characteristics of the environment that we operate in is that there's a great deal of complexity that Python helps us with. So we are doing business with um, three different mobile network operators in six different countries. Each one of those mobile network operators has a very different vision of what they want their customer experience to be. We have to support multiple languages, multiple currencies. Each one of those mobile network operators has their own um, systems and software for providing um, wallet services, for providing a USSD gateway, for providing text messaging services. It's very important that we have a flexible and easy to work with system behind that. So I talked about the customer journey. Um, one of the things that is uh, interesting about the environment we operate in is that we're not operating in a data environment. We know from our own research that less than 5% of our customer base actually has a smartphone. And uh, as we saw earlier in one of the presentations, there are a lot of questions about the quality of the data connection that's behind that. Um, so we use USSD uh, for our, con our consumer journey, for our customer journeys all the way through. That gives us the broadest possible range of coverage and the highest opportunity for adoption. Um, so we're, we're providing a solution for the environment that our customers live in today. Um, and it's, you know, the, the thing that is important to us as we build our customer journeys is that we make that as simple as possible. Um, and this is our mechanism to do that. Right, Ted. <clears throat> so what you're saying, Ted, is that we've got this really simple UI, this simple presentation of our product. Um, but we've got complexity in terms of how we deliver it and who we deliver it to. Um, and what kind of development <coughs> environment would be best suited for this? If you go by um, what Alan Kay said, um, it should make simple things easy and difficult things possible. Um, I want to just draw your attention to that screen, number three. Uh, this is a welcome screen that says, you know, welcome to our loan service, and it provides the customer with a list of options. Request a loan, repair a loan, check your balance, see information about the product, uh, or go back to the previous screen. We are going to dive into that in a few slides and kind of see the code behind it, um, how it tackles the simple problem of putting this on the customer's screen and some of the more complex issues around tracking what it's doing and distributing it to different MNOs. So when we set out to do this at Jumo, um, we looked around at the libraries and frameworks that existed. And then we decided that we'd be best off building a couple of in-house tools specifically to, challenge, uh, to tackle the challenges of USSD development. Um, one of them is what we call Django USSD. So just like it sounds, this is a Django app that's a layer on top of Django. And what it does is let us develop USSD screens as painlessly and declaratively as possible. Um, the other thing that it does is 
make it easy to interoperate with lots of MNO gateways and make it easy for our product owners to flexibly put together customer journeys. We also have uh, a simulator, a Django USSD simulator. And this basically lets us close the loop. So you know, you've got rapid application development. We're building these journeys as fast as we can. And we need to be able to give a product owner, a tester, the ability to try out the experience, just like the customer would experience it. Um, and with these two tools working in concert, we can build faster and test ideas. Um, so, you know, we've got Django, which is great, and now we've got a micro framework on top of it, and how do you justify uh, all these layers of complexity? Um, something I read a while ago uh, by Reginald Braithwaite, who actually comes from the Ruby on Rails community, um, it's a, this influential idea that, uh, here's a thought experiment. Imagine your code base, right? Print it out. Uh, take three markers, a red one, a green one, and a yellow one and go through your code. Now, every time you come upon something you just do not understand, total WTF, highlight it in red. Every time you find a line of code that you do understand, but its complexity isn't related to the problem you're solving, rather it's kind of accidental complexity. It's about the way that you're solving the problem. Then highlight it in yellow. And finally, um, when you find code that may be complex, but you do understand it, and everything that you see in it relates to your problem domain, then highlight that in green. So the philosophy that the ideal is to have no red code at all, which is tough to do, um, have some yellow code and have lots and lots of green code that is really about your business and your problems. Um, for our particular use case, for our scenarios, um, Green might be things like screens, like what we just saw. Um, validators, for instance, saying that at this point, the customer should only be able to input an integer. Yellow might be handling the details of things like session management, ensuring continuity between one screen and the next for different customers. Um, and maybe metrics, uh, capturing how long a customer spent on each screen. Red is where the non-explicit, uh, sort of magical, scary stuff lives. And for us, that's uh, where we've got metaprogramming and stuff that uh, supports our DSL living. So as promised, here's a, a code snippet um, that corresponds to one of the screens we saw on an earlier slide. Now, we've got uh, a class here, which represents a single screen. Um, and we've got a couple of attributes, two functions, two methods, rather. If this looks a bit like a uh, Django generic view or a Django ORM kind of uh, class. That's not accidental. It's inspired heavily by our use of Django. So, you know, without knowing very much else about this code, two things pop out. We've got this uh, prompt, this string, welcome to our loan service. There's some string substitution going on there uh, in partnership with Jumo. And we've got this list of options which corresponds to the actions that we saw on the screen that the customer could take. And there must be, you know, in the back of your mind you think there must be some magic going on here because uh, I just declare this class and magically a screen is created. But um, on the surface, I would like to think that this is green code that, you know, if you just joined Jumo and someone asked you to add a new option, uh, to this list, you would know where to go and how to add it and without too much head scratching. There is a final uh, three, set of three lines here which actually do address a business concern. So what's going on here is that this screen is for cash loans and at the time that we uh, took the screenshot, we were rolling out airtime credit loans to some customers. And that is managed by a feature flag in a Django admin UI using the Django waffle feature flag mechanism. So if that flag is active, and if this user is eligible for um, the offer of an airtime loan, then we dynamically add another option to this list of options, which lets them go to a previous menu where they could actually take an airtime loan. So when devs join Jumo, this is the kind of code I think that makes them see red, um, but hopefully over time it turns nice and yellow. 
we've got a meta class. Um, as you can see, it's helpfully named Handler Meta. And its intent is to do two things. Um, it may not be as clear as the previous slide, but uh, hopefully, um, if I tell you what it does, it'll come together. So two issues. Every time we create um, a screen class, um, we want to validate at the time that the Python module is loaded that this class makes sense in terms of Django USSD. So it could be a perfectly legitimate, valid Python class, but it might be missing attributes that we need for it to be a valid screen, uh, such as the prompt or the list of options, and so on. So in this code, um, the meta class is kind of dynamically walking through the attributes of the child class of the child class, uh, making sure that it has everything that's required. There's a bit of uh, missing detail here where you can speci specify what are required attributes, say, for an input screen or for uh, an option screen. And it's going to validate that. And at the moment that the Python module is loaded, or if you're doing CI, it'll blow up then rather than blow up in the user's face when they access that screen for the first time. And then once that's done, um, we've got uh, a namespace, a registry, where we keep these screens with the key being the name of the class, which means from one screen we can refer to another screen and say, if the user enters one, then proceed to that screen. And this, again, is the kind of thing that you could happily let a developer do. Like They could manually insert into the dictionary every time they created one. But by doing it implicitly in this yellowish, reddish code, you keep the screen declaration site green and simple to understand. So once we've built these customer journeys and um, got them right, the next source of effort from an engineering standpoint is performance and scaling. Um, and you know, if you think about when you bought your PyCon tickets, uh, you probably did it in a web browser. You had lots of time. You might have started the process, wandered off, come back later, had 10 tabs open. It's all very relaxed and kind of laid back. Um, if you were doing that on USSD, which is how our customers access our product, you'd have like three minutes, and in some cases, on any individual screen, if you took more than 30 seconds, you'd get booted out. And so it's really painful for a customer um, to have to start over simply because of performance issues on our site or because things are not snappy and responsive. And for that reason, uh, we keep a very close eye on metrics. We use New Relic. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, I'm just going to point out we've got three graphs here. This is basically a graph of our latency against time. Uh, it's topping out at about 300 milliseconds and it goes up and down by time of day. We've got our AppDex score, and that's just New Relic's kind of proprietary way of saying, on a scale of 0 to 1, how responsive is your app um, according to criteria that you specify? And finally, we've got this graph of throughput. Um, what I'd like to point out here is that um, the contribution of Python, Django, and Django USSD, our framework, uh, collectively is in this light blue layer and it basically hovers around 25 milliseconds on every request regardless of how much load we are under time of day um, and I think that says to us that we've got the right framework we've got the right tech stack to scale this and deal with you know as much volume as we might encounter getting across Africa and to other continents also I'm just going to point out um, most of the time, you know, service is spent making external requests to other services that need to be consulted to bring the whole product experience together. This is also a screen from New Relic. It's a scalability analysis. Um, and on the x, on the y-axis, we have response times again in milliseconds. But what changes is that on the x-axis, we have our load in requests per minute. Now, for a perfectly scalable app, uh, in an ideal world, what you'd like is you know, just a horizontal line, and whether you've got one request per minute or 10,000, it would be exactly the same. 
Um, but we're developers, we live in the real world, and we know that's impossible to attain. So you generally want a couple of things from a graph like this. One, you want uh, you know, kind of a smooth line with a relatively shallow curve that tells you that if you know, your transaction volume goes up to here, you're not going to be kind of in an exponential hell. Uh, secondly, you want your data points to be grouped relatively closely. Because that tells you that you don't have big, inexplicable variances in customer experience um, that you can't explain. And once again, when we look at this, uh, looking at Django USSD through the eyes of you know, performance metrics, again, we consider this a validation that at least for the immediate future, we're in the right place. Let us talk about the tech stack that we use. Um, Python, obviously, uh, Django, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, it lets us, using one library, one framework, uh, provide the USSD, provide the web simulator that testers can jump into to test out the USSD, um, and do kind of administrative things, dashboards, uh, views that product owners need, all within one kind of easy-to-use framework. Um, we're also very heavy users of uh, Celery. Um, and if you attended the Celery crossbar talk just before this one, you would have heard that it's a distributed task queue. Um, it, lets you, uh, it lets us, in particular, um, separate the parts of our application that need to be snappy and responsive um, from actions that can be delayed and done in the background asynchronously. So in, for our particular purposes, that lets us say, for instance, customer comes in, navigates through our menus, uh, indicates that they would like to take a loan or repay a portion of a loan. We capture that intent, that request, push it onto a queue somewhere, um, and now we're ready to service the next customer. Um, and eventually, a salary worker is going to wake up and communicate with one of the Jumo services responsible for actually dispersing that loan or collecting that repayment. For persistence, and in particular for um, our session storage, we use Postgres. And Celery has RabbitMQ working as its broker backend for message queuing. And that's what distributes horizontally to lots of machines and lets us scale our background workers uh, on a cluster. Where do we run all this stuff? Uh, we're big uh, fans of Amazon. Uh, we've, we're using lots of services on Amazon, but two stand out. The Elastic Beanstalk service has basically let us spin up lots of environments, uh, scale them, replace them without too much hair pulling or head scratching. Um, and for our database needs, uh, Relational Database Service, RDS, um, gives us the ability to run Postgres, offload operational concerns and DevOps from the devs, let them build the customer journeys faster. RabbitMQ is kind of... Uh, difficult to cluster, and we haven't found a perfect solution to running it without having to think about things like the cap theorem, what happens in net splits, and so on. But so far, the, the smoothest experience we've had is with CloudMQP, and that's just a RabbitMQ as a service provider. Uh, what they are doing is uh, hosting that for you, making sure that it's in multiple availability zones and doing a lot of the operational uh, work. Let's talk about testing. Um, this is important for any dev team. It's doubly important for us. We want a good experience for the customer without breaking things. On the other hand, uh, we are in financial services and mistakes can cost us. So there's two um, sides to this. One is that as part of our Django USSD framework, we have built uh, an automated test client. And again, if you're looking at this and seeing similarities with what you might do, say, in Django, again, it's no accident, it's inspired by it. Um, what's going on in this particular snippet is that um, we are mocking out calls to external services. And having done that, we are able to instantiate uh, our USSD client, and therefore a customer coming in phone number zero and a bunch of ones, and they're landing on a screen called get user status. Um, and if this client enters one, uh, this test case tests that they, a customer requesting a loan who has a forbidden status should not be able to actually access the loan. 
um, then they should get the message, you do not qualify um, and should not be able to proceed. Uh, at the top, you're going to see a couple of decorators stacked on the function. Um, we're just using the patch library to mock out calls to two services that need to be consulted before we can go ahead and issue a loan. The other part of our testing story is manual. So automated tests are great and necessary, but they're never going to catch all your problems. They're not, certainly not going to make sure that the developers understood what needed to be built in the same terms as you know, product owners or customers. So we have this USSD simulator. Um, the great thing about it is that it lets you know, a product manager jump in and try out the customer experience for any of our products, regardless of geography, whether or not they have a SIM card that fits the country they're from, and whether it's on roaming, etc. Um, so typically, they will come to this screen and choose the product they want to interact with. They can choose um, a language. We are serving this product in multiple languages, and so localization concerns are way up there. Um, they can choose a user type, which is more like a user state, for instance, needs to repay a loan, is overdue, and so on, and enter a phone number so that they can track this down the line. And at that point, they can then interact with the product just like the customer would on the screen. So there's lots of value in having this. It's not perfect fidelity in the sense of the exact experience you'd have on a feature phone, but then the trade-off is that you can do this anywhere on your laptop, uh, on your mobile device, without necessarily having to provision a SIM. Uh, the other really useful thing is that very often we will build customer journeys before our partners are ready to support them. And so early on in the planning process, we can kind of mock out things, get happy with the experience, um, and then plug it into our partners later. Um, this is not the sexiest topic, but it's important. So you, you know, we've built the customer journey, we've tested and validated it, and now it's out in production. How do we know exactly what it's doing? Um, we are very into structured logging, and we use the Python struct log library, and what that does basically is you can take a dictionary of values, feed it to struct log, and it'll output it in you know, a nice machine-readable format. We are using key value uh, timestamped events. So for example, the event where a customer dialed in with that phone number and entered that text for, uh, while using our consumer product in Rwanda on Tigo, would be written out to logs in that format. Uh, the big takeaway from this is that by logging all this stuff up front, we've found we're able to come along later and do ad hoc queries with it on services like Sumo Logic or Splunk and derive insights that we didn't know we needed up front. For example, this visualization. Um, unfortunately, I can't zoom in, but you have to take my word for it. This is uh, a customer journey kind of dynamically visualized. So if you've ever looked at uh, the flow screen of Google Analytics, this is kind of the analog of it. And it's built from the actual interactions of customers with our various screens. Um, we can see the text that they saw, or representative text that they saw on each screen. We can see the transitions between them and what inputs they had to enter to move around. Um, and having something like this available on demand is really useful when you've got lots of development going on and people are asking things like, what is the state of the customer journey right now? And rather than having them go off and have to look at release messages, logs, and that's things like that, um, this becomes authoritative. And you can look at it historically as well. So we're coming to the end of our um, allocated time. I just want to take a few minutes to talk about forward-looking topics. Um, think these are things that are on our roadmap that we would like to do uh, to improve the developer experience. The first one is somewhat ironic. Um, namespaces are a wonderful thing in Python. You know, they kind of support everything. Object system is built on them. But we're not making as good use of them as we could. So far too often, you've got developers either naming things to avoid collisions, is terrible, or having to mentally kind of remember what product, what context they're in. Um, and some of us are working really hard on making sure that uh, easy namespaces for different products and different versions of products, A-B testing and so on, are easy to define. Um, 
Early on in our development, we made the decision to kind of hack on top of the Django session management uh, system. And that was great because it let us get off the ground and focus on building the custom experience without worrying too much about how uh, a bunch of different requests got correlated into one conversation. Um, but it was kind of a hack. And you know, Django session management is not necessarily aimed at the kind of thing that we are doing. It's kind of aimed at web browsers, web clients. Um, and we've gotten to the point where we absolutely need to build something uh, that's better suited to our purposes. Um, internationalization. Uh, so for the kinds of things we're doing, uh, it's, it's always been from day one important to make sure that we could present it in the user's language. Uh, now, this is something that um, I would love to hear other people's opinions on and their experiences. We've been using kind of the default uh, mechanism, get text, uh, for this. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to have a workflow of translators and product owners and developers and have changes made consistently and reliably and get them out there uh, without people making mistakes, typos, hair pulling, and all kinds of pain. So we are looking at alternatives or things that we can build on top of it. And finally, the holy grail um, is to take the job of composing the customer journey and make it into something dynamic, empower you know, product owners rather than developers to define screens and uh, link them, move them around, change content. It's probably never going to be 100% possible because you've got all kinds of business logic going on in various places. But if we can segregate that logic and then make it easy for the high level view to be manipulated graphically through a kind of drag and drop UI, um, then we're going to be able to move even faster and the devs are going to have more time to do cool things. Uh, so that's it. Thank you for listening to us and uh, I'd be happy to take your questions now. Hello. Hi. On the chart that you were mapping the response time, um, you said that those spikes were due to the, the request to third party services. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you also said that you're using um, Celery and Rabbit and Q. So I was just curious um, how do you account for that discrepancy? And would something with an async um, framework like async IO or Twisted um, improve that? That's a fantastic question. Um, so one, uh, one part of the answer is that we do want things to be responsive. And so when a USSD, gets serv when a USSD service first gets a request from a customer, there's a bunch of state to look up about that customer. For instance, do they have a loan outstanding? If so, how much do they owe? And so on. Um, and so when that comes in, we need to aggregate a bunch of data. We could try and cache it, but um, cache consistency is hard, and in this context, it would be even harder to make sure that we always had the right answer. So there's going to be um, an initial request that's going to be account for most of the green that you see in there that is kind of unavoidably synchronous in our model. But once we've loaded that, then the USSD service can go through the rest of the customer experience without any further external calls, and then ultimately put the outcome of that interaction onto a queue. So what, what you're describing would definitely help us in terms of um, making these calls uh, with fewer processes, fewer boxes, um, but we wouldn't be able to bring down that delay, that initial delay, uh, to grab that information without some trade-offs about using stale data, potentially. Hi. Hi. Um, my former colleague here, <laughs> yes, Tommy, he, he said that when he uh, was interviewed, he was told first, I mean, uh, beforehand, that it is not Wonga. Wonga is not also that loan shark application. <laughs> it was, <laughs> but uh, it got a lot of uh, noise in, in the UK and stuff. <coughs> so uh, what I want to ask is, um, do you guys have any mechanisms to get around, you know, things such as uh, money laundering and all of that stuff? Because um, your 
the people that you you are after are mainly unbankable. So if I am unbankable and I've got a tax shop somewhere and uh, <coughs> I want a one million <laughs> rent loan, you know, what happens? So let me let me rephrase the question to make sure I've got it right. So the the the, the, the fundamental question you're you're getting at is is how do we avoid Jumo becoming a mechanism for money laundering itself, right? Um, so I'm trying to think what money laundering would look like in a Jumo context, right? I'm guessing that someone would take a loan and then through an agent bring in money from some illicit source and use that to repay the loan. So, how do I repay the loan, by the way? So you would read, so the, 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 the mechanics here are that we're doing loan, dispersing loan proceeds from your mobile money, from a Jumo-owned mobile money wallet okay. to a customer yes. mobile money wallet, yes. and then striking for repayment from the customer's mobile money wallet back to the Jumo wallet, right? So there's, there's a little element of control there, but the, you know, the other thing is, um, the amounts of money we're talking about here in our loan portfolio are very, very small on a per loan basis. Yeah, that's on the merchant side, right? That's a very, very small, number-wise, that's a very small percentage of our business, and we exert a very much higher degree of control on the know-your-customer side for those people. In fact, we might actually physically put somebody on the ground to speak to a merchant before we allow them to take a loan. When you think about a, a consumer, on average, our loans are extremely small, less than US $10. Um, and so it's, I, I suppose conceivably somebody could do money laundering in that way, but they'd have to be awfully, uh, awfully enthused about the possibilities to do it in that small quantity. <laughs> okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, hi, great talk. Uh, I have two questions. One is, I think it's really cool that um, Jumo focuses on the customer experience, um, but what happens when the system rejects the customer? Um, this is a potential customer, but based on some kind of data that you're pulling, they do not qualify for the loan. So what are the initiatives that you take for that customer to make them um, better? And then the second, the second question is, um, in terms of API, especially from telcos, how did you do that? <laughs> it is impossible in East Africa to get telcoms to work with you. So if you could just share your, your logic. Um, okay, let me try to address uh, both and then Ted will add any thoughts he has. Um, customers could be rejected for a whole bunch of reasons. Sometimes you know or you have a strong indication um, that there's fraudulent activity. Um, and our data science team is thinking about this night and day, um, putting in place checks or that kind. And if you're rejecting someone for that reason because uh, of fraud, um, you're not necessarily trying to work to get them back uh, through some other avenue. But you know, um, we rely on data and sometimes we don't have the data we need to decide whether someone is a good credit risk. Um, so in some markets, in Kenya for example, uh, we will say, well okay, keep using mobile money, keep using Airtel money in order to build up the transaction history that will let you qualify. Um, and then at some point, hopefully you will get an SMS campaign message from us saying, you know, congratulations, you qualify to use the product now. Um, so if there's a path to being able to use the product, we absolutely want the customers to be on that path, and it's vital um, to our growth that we do. <clears throat> uh, as for the API question, um, our biz dev team is awesome. Uh, it, it certainly helps in early on to be able to demonstrate what you're trying to do. If, if you can build a working implementation of your fintech platform, or whatever it is, um, and, and show the telco that you have a business rather than just an idea, um, then they become much more amenable to sitting down with you and sharing APIs and doing things like that. Um, there isn't a silver bullet. That said, um, there are certain projects uh, like uh, the Prekeld Foundation and Vumi has got like, really, if you look in there, they've got all these transports uh, for different MNOs. 
Um, and that could save you some effort if that API is in the public domain and you're just looking for an implementation. So I'll add a quick comment on the, on the first part, on the first question. Um, we, one of the ways that we um, try to reduce the amount, uh, the number of customers that are going to have a, a rejection experience also is by targeting marketing. Right, so we do, we or our MNO partners or MNO partners through us do um, broadcast SMS messages to customers that we know are eligible for a loan, right? So it's an imperfect solution, but it does, it does, help, um, it does help a little bit in terms of reducing the number of people who have a, uh, the bad experience or the rejection experience. Okay, that's all the questions we have time for. Thank you very much, Sam and Ted.